Today we expand our view to include the atmosphere and climate. Kathy Dello is a climatologist at Oregon State University, the Associate Director of Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, and Deputy Director of the Oregon Climate Service, the State Climate Office for Oregon. Her work includes climate impact analysis, climate adapt adaptation, state agency engagement, and public outreach. She coordinated Oregon's first climate assessment report. In her spare time, she's completing her coursework toward a PhD in environmental sciences at OSU. Welcome to the show, Kathy. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. So we have a rather serious topic on the table in front of us today. Um, <laughs> where would you like to begin where? on such a huge uh, issue? So we can start thinking about the past few years, which haven't seemed normal at all, because they haven't been. Yeah, um, I would agree. 2014 was one of our warmest years on record, and it was the warmest year globally, so we weren't immune to that here in the Northwest. And 2015 has also started out warm as well. So if you've tried to go skiing in the mountains, you might have noticed there wasn't much snow, snow to come by. <laughs> yes. Um, and we're, having, we're seeing that play out right now. Um, mm -hmm. The implications are huge for our water supply this summer. Wow. Um, and is there any chance that this is going to be a strange summer with more rain than usual? or? Well, we can hope, um, <laughs> but we had a really dry spring as well. Um, I know it doesn't seem like it today. We walked in and it seems a little gray and maybe showery, but uh, it's actually been quite dry for the past few months. So after that warm winter without the snow, we were hoping to get a lot of rain this spring and it didn't happen. And unfortunately, it's looking like summer might be dry as well. And we know our summers are dry here anyway. Yeah, I think there were a lot of people, myself included, keeping their fingers crossed that maybe we would just kind of switch seasons. You know, we would have a dry spring and a, a, a rainy summer. Yeah, everybody's hoping for a January, but even the rainiest Junes won't make up the deficits that we're facing right now. Yeah, that seems to be the case. So what are, we, what are we talking about long term here? What are we, this or medium term, you know, let's just start with medium term. So I keep telling people we need to get through this summer first. And it looks like it actually might be quite warm. Uh, the odds are tilted very strongly toward us having a warm summer, in part because of the Pacific Ocean right now. Mm -hmm. The temperatures off our coast are, are much warmer than they normally are. So when we have that warm summer, our water demand increases um, and we see our fire our wildfire um, vulnerability increase as well, mm -hmm. and it's also uncomfortable for us. It was warm here in Eugene last summer. I think you set a record for days over 90. Um, so we yes, could see a summer like that again. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, are there prognostications about the next few years? So we can look maybe past the summer a little bit, and I'm really cautious about this because right now in the spring, we don't have a lot of predictability for the six month time period, but that's what a lot of people want. If we get through the summer, will we have a wet winter? And right now the odds are pointing toward an El Nino event, which tends to make our winters warm and dry. So oh. more bad news, but the thing is, right now it's still up in the air. I wouldn't run with that. Um, diagnosis and tell people it's absolutely going to happen, but I'd keep an eye on it. So we've seen drought in Oregon for the past four years. Uh, we hear a lot about California in the news, but it's actually extended up into Oregon as well. Mm -hmm. And Eastern Oregon and Southern Oregon are feeling the biggest impacts of it. So a fifth year of these conditions would just be um, extremely detrimental. Um. You mentioned South and Eastern Oregon are, are getting the worst of that, and I, I think most of us who live around here knew, but what does that mean in, in real effects? What are they actually dealing with? What they're dealing with is water shortages. So some people aren't getting their water, or some irrigation districts are saying, this is the water you normally get, you're going to see 25% of that. Um, we're so this is for irrigation, Fish, fish runs, um, what else? Uh, recreation, uh, so actually- Home use, home use. use. Um, so there aren't any municipal restrictions right now. California has told their uh, cities that they have to reduce by 25%. Oregon mm -hmm. has not done that. Um, but we're, we're seeing people pitch in and 
they're trying to conserve water. We're all in this together. Any drop of water that you don't use is left in stream for fish or other uses. Mm -hmm. But one of the, the biggest impacts that we're seeing is actually in our backyard. Detroit Lake, eight of the nine boat launches are too high above the water right now to be used. And we're going into Memorial Day where people tend to take their boats out and go camping and there's only one that they can use. So we're seeing the impacts start to really play out. Mm -hmm. Um, if this continues into a fifth year, and, and if it's due to this El Nino effect, how long can we expect this El Nino to continue? El Ninos are pretty short, um, 12 to 18 months. Uh, we flip back and forth between El Nino neutral, which we've been in the past few years, and then La Nina, which tilts our odds towards cooler weather. But um, this year, in particular, is the worst uh, year of those four. This looks a lot like 76, 77 in terms of the impacts. That, that's a big west coast drought. And then 1992 where we had low snowpack and we saw impacts to places like Seattle, which are normally pretty uh, resilient to things like drought. And were those also El Nino years? No, not necessarily. So this drought didn't happen because of El Nino. It happened so we can go back to two years ago when we had this huge ridge um, over the west coast. And last winter was pretty normal in terms of temperatures, but actually quite dry. We, we had a, a fairly wet spring that made up some of the deficits. But this year, we had a very warm winter and almost near normal precipitation until about February. So the same outcome, low snowpack, but two different ways to get there. So 1992 was also a warm year but 77 was a dry year. Hmm. So I know that you, everyone is hesitant to do much predicting, but what are you, what are you thinking about? What, what are the predictions in the next few years? So that's actually the hardest time scale to forecast for, but if we're talking about our future this winter and what we're seeing now, looks a whole lot like the middle of the century. Um, this is what climate change looks like in Oregon. Warm winters, low snowpack, and if the warm summer plays out, that's another piece of it. So right now, while this is terrible and it's impacting us now, we have this opportunity to start to think about our future. This isn't going away. This is going to keep happening, and we're going to see more of these low snowpack years. So what we're doing is loading the deck with these. Um, we'll have big snowpack years in the future. We'll have great ski seasons. But what we're doing is each year we're increasing the chance that it'll be a warm winter and a low snowpack year. So places like our low elevation ski resorts, um, they may not see as much snow as they have in the past. Uh, and we're certainly looking at our water supply. And also, we talked a little bit about this before, but increased population into the state. So we, ha we have more people moving here for whatever reason, and they're going to need water as well. Are there any serious uh, organized water conservation efforts underway in the state? Um, not any organized ones, but like I said, Oregonians are special and I think are pitching in to help out with this drought. Um, it's the question that everybody asks me. I know this drought's going on, but what can I do? We have this divide where it's really impacting our rural populations, but those of us in urban areas can turn on our tap and water will come out uh, no matter what. But people want to do something. They, they want to feel like they're helping out. So I've, I know that people have maybe stopped watering their lawns, although they haven't needed to for the past few weeks, maybe stopped washing their cars, simple things like turning off the sink when, when you brush your teeth, um, saving water from when your shower heats up and then using that in your garden. Um, little things like that do add up. Saving water from when your shower heats up, what, what do you mean by that? So you know when you turn on the shower and you wait for it to come to a temperature that you can uh, tolerate yeah that water is going down the drain usually oh, but if so you just throw right a bucket okay um, oh, that's a good idea yeah and it's perfectly clean fine water that you can use you know this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot at my own home I have to let the water run for probably a good 30 seconds before it gets hot and I'm always thinking oh all of that water you know it's just it's just lost 
So, and I, it never even occurred to me to just put a bucket under there and yeah, catch and it. And just use it <laughs> elsewhere. That's such a common sense thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I think we're finding people are more comfortable with uh, letting their lawns go brown. They're supposed to here in the Northwest, but that was very taboo in some neighborhoods that you have a brown lawn and your neighbor has this lush green lawn. Um, we need to move away from the expectation that everything should be green year-round here. What do you think about some kind of uh, public information campaign to persuade people to maybe get rid of lawns? I think we're seeing some of that, especially in California. A few cities have actually offered to pay people to tear out their lawns. And some people have done it happily. Uh, if, you hate, if you hate lawn work, um, having a lawn that's low maintenance and uh, filled with stones and succulents is pretty pretty easy for those people. It's going to take a big shift, like I said. Um, not everybody's okay with not having a lawn. I mean, some people aren't okay with having a brown lawn. But it's up to, it's up to each city how they deal with that. Of course, you know, having a brown lawn isn't the only option. And also having rocks isn't the only option. There are mulches and wood chips that are soft underfoot and um, aesthetically pleasing and don't require watering. <laughs> so yeah, you know, that's the direction I think I'm going. Just because I don't have the uh, inclination really to look after a lawn. So, and I, I would prefer not to expend the resources on maintaining it. So yeah, I, I think we'll we'll see people move in that direction. Um, and. Drought in the Pacific Northwest is kind of something that's really tough for people, especially in other parts of the country, to wrap their heads around. They think we are wet all the time, mm -hmm. they think it rains here all the time, and I think people here also have some trouble with that. We, we can't be in a drought because it just seems so wet here. It's just here. not possible in yeah. the Pacific Northwest, yeah. But we're starting to see, I think, people um, gain acceptance and maybe we'll start to see some of the lawns move in this direction. It's not like California yet, but we're getting close. Well, it, even though it's not like California, you've, you've mentioned that we are in our fourth year of drought. Um, how is that defined? How, how, do you, how do you determine that a region is in drought? That's an excellent question. It's a, it's a simple question and a not so simple answer. But um, essentially, you don't have enough water for something. And that could be a hydrologic drought. You don't have enough water in your stream for a fish. That could be a meteorological drought, what I look at. You don't have enough rain. You don't have enough snow. It could be a recreational drought. Um, any sort of sector that's impacted can, can be in drought. We have agricultural droughts. Uh, forests are something that, with multiple years of drought in a row, start to get really stressed. And I think we're seeing some of that around the state already. So it really depends on your sector, but this drought is pretty cross-cutting. I don't know of a single sector that's being spared right now. Yeah, the arborists in this area have already expressed the opinion that we're seeing a lot of trees dying just randomly around uh, because of lack of water. You know, we, they normally would get their year's supply during the winter and they're not getting it, so. Yeah, I believe it. And with how warm it was, we, we saw our warmest winter on record here in western Oregon. So people really knew something was up when flowers started blooming. In, in January. Yeah. yeah. My tulips were coming up in January. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> the daffodils <laughs> were out weird. early. <laughs> yeah. Around campus, all the, um, the bushes were blooming much earlier than normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was looking at the wildflowers that come up around my place. They were, they were about a month early. And that's what we're looking at in terms of temperature. We've already hit 80 a few times this year. Um, mm -hmm. Normally, mid-May would be our first 80-degree day, and I think we hit that in mid-April. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there ought to be more that we can do about this. Surely somebody has some ideas about that. Yeah, so one of the things... Beyond putting the, the bucket under your tap and catching the water. Yeah. Yes, that's fair. Uh, but one of the things that I work on is climate adaptation. So we know that climate change is happening. We know Oregon's going to be impacted by it. We could stop using fossil fuels today. 
as a globe and we would still see warming. So we have to learn to deal with this somehow. And one of the biggest issues, and in my opinion, the biggest issue this state's going to face with climate change is water availability. Because we've relied so much on that snowpack to be our natural reservoir and melt out through the summer. And when we see a year like this year and it's not there and we don't have that anymore, we need to find a different way to store water. And water storage is incredibly controversial. Um, many people don't want another dam and I don't think you'll see another one. But people are starting to think about how do we manage our water? How do we store our water? Is there any sort of policy mechanism or something we can do differently to make sure that we have water for the summer? So much beyond putting the bucket in your shower, but mm -hmm. bigger, um, higher level changes that aren't going to happen easily, but people are absolutely thinking about. Well, now it's been reported in the media recently that water coming from north of here, out of the mountains in Canada in particular, uh, is fine. It's, you know, the snowpack there is normal, and so the rivers are at normal level, you know, and that's, you know, making its way down the Columbia and other tributaries. So, it, it, I can see a couple of possible issues here. One is that at least part of the state may be saying drought, what drought? And, and the other would be other people saying, they've got water, we want some of it. Can, can that be trucked down or transported in some way? You know, it, it, are those kinds of conversations going on? So California um, would love to take water from north of them and it's, almost impossible to do that sort of thing. Uh, there was a crazy idea floated by somebody that they would steal Seattle's water and build a pipeline to California. But um, Seattle is also in a pretty similar situation, although they, their water supply is fine for the summer, they said, even though they declared a statewide drought in Washington. But um, water transfers across states uh, are tricky. If you look at the Colorado, river situation. Um, the Columbia is not at that level, and I don't know that it will ever get there. But um, I guess if things got bad enough, people might start floating those ideas. I don't see that happening in no, the... I wasn't necessarily talking about transporting water across state lines. I was talking about right here in Oregon. You know, if, if folks who are right around the Columbia River have water because there's plenty of water in the Columbia, then maybe folks further south in Oregon would say, we want some of that. So if you look at how California engineered their water system, they move water hundreds of miles. We don't do much of that in Oregon. And I, you may, that may have set California up for some, some tough times. I don't know that you'll see that happen even in Oregon. I, I don't think the water rights structure right now would facilitate a transfer like that from the Columbia down to Southern Oregon. And sometimes the Canadian snowpack isn't great. Sometimes the Rockies are in as much trouble as we are. So it could be a band-aid to a longer term problem. Mm -hmm. But is, would you agree that at least this summer there, that snowpack further north seems to be okay and those rivers coming out of that snowpack are more or less norm, more, uh, normal level, has that been reported correctly? Yeah, so the flows in the Columbia are closer to normal than, say, the Willamette. The Willamette flows are quite low right now, and mm -hmm. actually most of the stream flows statewide are, are much below where they would be. And part of that is because of reservoir releases, but a lot of it has to do with the dry spring and the low snowpack. So I, I keep coming back to what can we do? Um, you, I know we mentioned earlier at the start of the show that you have been working on a climate assessment report. Tell us about that. So every two years, as, uh, per our legislation for the Institute, we have to write an assessment report. I coordinated the first one in 2010. Our Institute started in 2007. Um, what we do is just assess the state of science as it pertains to Oregon. And then there was an update in 2013 as part of the National Climate Assessment. There was a companion Northwest report. And that really just lays out the problem, um, what we're facing in the future and what we're facing now in terms of climate change in the Northwest. And the four main topics are 
impacts to coasts, impacts to agriculture, impacts to water, and impacts to forests. And the report even says that by mid-century our forests are going to look dramatically different. Um, How so? Wildfire uh, invasion from pests and diseases, things like bark beetle that haven't really existed here before. Um, if you've spent any time in Colorado, you've seen their forests are just decimated by this beetle. And we might we might get a glimpse of that sort of thing this summer in terms of wildfire. The fire outlook is projected to be above average for the Northwest. And yesterday I found out that California, Washington, and Oregon are projected to have the worst wildfire seasons in the country. What about the Willamette Valley specifically? The Willamette Valley is a little bit different. Um, so fire risk actually does increase across the entire state. And in Corvallis, we had a small fire last year in one of the parks on a very hot, dry day. Um, so we could see big fires on the west side in the future. Um, but for the Willamette Valley, we there's some research that shows that we'll be pretty okay in terms of water supply going into the future. Um, we have our reservoirs. Uh, they do fill with rain, so they're not entirely snowpack dependent, so we're, we're pretty fortunate there. But there will be impacts to the, to the valley, and the risks are very real. Um, there is agriculture in the valley, and if it warms up, something like the Pinot Noir grape grows at a very specific temperature range. And if it warms up too much, we might have to start thinking about growing other grapes. And it's not just a matter of, well, I'm just going to put these grapes in and grow those. It, people have invested a lot of time in these, mm -hmm. in these orchards. and. Um, vineyards, and the state has invested a lot of money in promoting Pinot Noir as an Oregon thing. Mm -hmm. So just simple things like that, where you see it cascade down. But we know our population is going to increase in the Willamette Valley. It has, and it's going to continue to do so. So we have more people to deal with as well. Is there any kind of contingency plan that's being worked on for the agricultural effects of higher temperatures and less rain? So there are a lot of people thinking about this, and you can actually talk to farmers out in eastern Oregon who have changed things already. It's either to use less water and increase yields, they figure out a way to do that in some cases. Not necessarily because of climate and climate change, but because it's more profitable to them, or they've seen reduced water over the past few years. Um, there's a lot of research on planting different things and if they can thrive in warmer climates. Um, one of the positives is that we might have a longer growing season, uh, but that means a few things that are also negatives. We could see more weeds. Uh, you could see a frost in the middle of that longer growing season. So we don't really know how all the plants are going to survive. Um, and the wine industry has actually thought about this a lot as well. I would guess. Uh, they stand to lose a lot of money if things don't go well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And grape vines aren't something that you can just put in the ground this spring and have a harvest this fall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that, it doesn't work that way. Oh, my. It's, um, it's not a, a happy picture, is it? No, it's not. It, our future is quite scary. But the good news is, is that there's still some time for us to change. Um, there's still some time for us to change the path we're on. Is this based on your assessment report? It's based on science, um, so it was in the assessment report. But the Northwest will warm. It will continue to warm. But the amount of warming is dependent on global greenhouse gas emissions. So if there were to be a global strategy or global policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we could see a reduced warming. Um, so there is still some time for change. It's just going to have to be something much bigger than the state of Oregon reducing greenhouse gases. And we've already started doing that. We've seen our emissions actually decline um, while our economy has grown. So we've shown the rest of the world it's possible to reduce your emissions while grow your, growing your economy. From, from your seat of working as a climatologist and dealing with other people who are looking at these questions, would you say that people in Oregon are possibly more open to just grappling with the issue than the average person? I would say so, and Oregonians are pretty special. I moved here six years ago now, and I was just, um, it just really, what's the word? Um, 
I was just really blown away by how much people cared about where they lived and where they're from. There's a, an enormous amount of state pride that you don't see in Washington or California. And they want Oregon to be the Oregon that they either grew up in and they want their kids to grow up in the same Oregon. They want you know, snow on the mountains. They want beautiful forests for them to go hiking and camping in um, and for them to enjoy, but also have this vibrant economy that we've always had, um, where we've lived off the land. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of public um, disapproval, I guess, out there about climate change. But in Oregon, it seems a little bit easier than places, other places in the country. Well, I suppose that is encouraging in a way, although, as you pointed out, there's only so much that Oregon can do by itself, you know, if, if others aren't also taking this seriously. Yeah, and we've always seen California take the lead on these sorts of things, and they have been. Um, and in my opinion, all the cool stuff happens at the state level. Federal policy moves very slow. Um, and you've seen our Congress over the past few years, a lot doesn't happen sometimes. But state by state, we can start to see people um, fill in the gaps and start to do things. So California's taken the lead. Washington's doing some work. Oregon's doing work. New York's doing a lot of work. And hopefully, the other states come on board. And those are states that have high population centers. Yeah. So th what they do matters. Absolutely. And like I said, leading by example, showing you can grow your economy and also reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, that it doesn't have to be one or the other. And Oregon and California have both done that. What, how much of a factor do you think is the, the, the very organized attempts by those who deny climate change and want to stop all attempts to deal with it? I mean, are they, do you think they're likely to slow us down significantly or stop us? They completely? have slowed us down. Um, if, if you've tracked um, how people have thought and viewed this issue over the past 20 years, we're almost, we're coming out of this downturn, but there was a point there where it just, it seemed to turn in another direction, and I won't make any political judgments. What seemed to turn in another direction? Uh, the public opinion about climate change. So oh. maybe in the early 90s, it almost seemed a little bit easier to talk about this. And then mid-2000s, late 2000s, with the recession and a few other things, um, it started to get pretty bad again. Mm -hmm. And I think, I feel like we're coming out of it. It seems a little bit easier in the past few years, especially with a summer like this one. What happened? And we can't we can't deny that something's happening. So we have to take this seriously and start to think about solutions and stop mm -hmm. bickering. But it's unfortunate that there are people like this out there. Well, of course, most people don't have a dog in the fight. And when you're, when you're just focused on day-to-day -day survival, as was the case from 2008 till you know, just recently, it's hard to give much attention to something like climate change, which just seems out there. You know, I, that doesn't have anything to do with me and I can't do anything about it anyway. You know, but I can't look for a job. <laughs> yeah. So I can understand that, um, you know, that kind of makes sense. The, there are a lot of folks though who aren't in that position who seem to be doing this just out of perversity. <laughs> They're just trying to get in the way just because they can, and, it, yeah. and they may, maybe they think it's even fun in a weird sort of way. I, it's it's, it's kind of disturbing to watch. It's very disturbing, and I've been on the other side of it um, many times. But the science is sound, and it's, it's as certain as gravity that climate change is happening. We, we know this, and we can point to physics, we can point to science. Um, mm -hmm. Where the debate needs to be and where it should be is in how we fix it. And I'm not the person to come up with that solution. Yeah. But um, it's, I understand that people aren't thinking about climate change from day to day the way that I am. I, it's one of many things that they have to think about. But what we're looking at right now is the biggest environmental disaster of our generation. And if we think about future generations, we need to leave the planet better than we found it. Sure. And we're certainly not doing that. Yeah, it seems to be maybe one of our best arguments is you know, you got kids? Have you got grandkids? 
do you care about them? <laughs> yeah. We've got to walk. We've got to act right now. Yeah, you're not going to be here to take care of them when they grow up and have to live in this terrible world with natural disasters. And it's, it's not going to be good. Yeah. I, I think one of the most horrible things I can imagine is this lovely green area that I live in turning into a desert. I mean, that just horrifies me to think of. It horrifies me to think of the Oregon that I moved to not being the same anymore. I just love being outside. I love mm -hmm. climbing up in the mountains. I love playing out in the snow. And the fact that I couldn't do that this year was just very strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know a lot of other people feel the same way. Yeah. So tell me more about uh, what you reported in the climate assessment. Well, um, like I said, it's just a compilation of the state of science. So you, there's no lack of climate reports out there or climate <laughs> papers. Um, so we just go through the peer-reviewed literature and assess it, say, this is what this says for Oregon. Um, and we do these periodically. And they almost converge on the same thing every time. Like I said, coasts, water, agriculture, and forests. Um, those are most vulnerable areas and like we were talking about before this that's everything in Oregon pretty much. Um, people are also thinking about public health as well that's one of the impacts we haven't really seen much of in Oregon yet but will vector-borne diseases move into the state? Will drought um, cause public health impacts? Uh, will there be food insecurity with climate change? Uh, so people are actually thinking a lot about this the state's thinking about this as well. Um, regarding food insecurity, that um, is something that we've kind of talked about among ourselves here, and we'll probably be doing a show on it as well. I, I realize that that's probably outside of your purview, but is that something that gets tossed around among you and your colleagues about ways that that you could that we could all mitigate uh, food security issues? You know, like it's been suggested that if we planted all of our lawns in vegetables, then we could, we could do, go pretty far to, to uh, secure our food supply. Are there, do you hear these kinds of ideas being discussed? I hear concern over food insecurity, and like you said, this is a little bit outside my area, but I think with the California drought in the past two years, we're going to see prices increase dramatically on food. They grow a lot of the food for the country, um, and we grow quite a bit of food for the rest of the country as well and ourselves. Um, and seeing how these two years play out is going to be a wake-up call for people. And I, I don't know how we mitigate it. Like you said, if we tear out our lawns and fill it with vegetables, maybe, but I don't know. Well, the, another idea that has been tossed around is instead of growing grass seed, you know, grow food crops. Uh, which I don't know in, pra in, in reality if that would work because it may depend on the, the soil that is in those regions and what the water supply looks like. And so m maybe that can be done, maybe it can't be done. I don't know, but it seems like it would be worth looking at at least. Yeah, for sure. And I know that, I mean, the biggest food insecurity uh, vulnerabilities are in the rural areas where it's sometimes tough to come by food already. Um, yeah. Um, y you mentioned the impact on coasts. What might those impacts look like? So we're seeing actually some of this already, and there's sea level rise, which we talk a lot about, um, but also coastal erosion. So if you go out near Neskowin and Tillamook, you can see houses that are right up against the shoreline already and are eroding away with uh, every big storm that that comes along. So we get these big winter storms and there's some evidence that they've increased in um, intensity over the past few years and we have bigger waves associated with these storms. Hmm. So also a lot of the coastal communities are thinking about how they're going to adapt to this, um, knowing that there's coastal erosion, there's sea level rise on top of that. So as the, the water level increases and you have these storms and you increase the level a little bit more, what is that going to do? But also, there's the threat of a tsunami. So you have this chronic hazard, climate change, and this acute hazard, a tsunami. And 
the coast is really thinking about resilience and preparedness. Um, but it's difficult, like you said, not everybody's thinking about climate change every day. I would say people on the coast are more concerned, and maybe rightfully so, about a tsunami and a large earthquake, because we know that's imminent. We know it could happen any day, and we know it will just decimate the coast. It'll also drop the shoreline a bit as well, so any sea level rise will be exacerbated. It would drop it because of erosion from the tsunami? Because or? of the way the subduction zone um, is working right now. So the plate is lifting up, but once it slips, um, it'll drop about a foot. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's, uh, that's significant. Yeah, it's very significant. And then there's ocean acidification, which isn't really a climate change impact. It's climate change's um, nasty cousin because it happens because of CO2 in the atmosphere as well. And our oceans have absorbed quite a bit of our CO2 that we admitted into the atmosphere, so it could be worse. But we're seeing impacts to our shell fisheries um, because of these acidified waters, especially off the Pacific Northwest coast. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you mentioned um, coasts, forests, and what were the other four impact or the other two impact areas? Agriculture and water. Agriculture, and okay, so water in general um, for anybody's use. Yeah, mostly it's focusing on the loss of the snowpack. So we've seen our snowpack decline over time. Mm -hmm. um, over the last few decades already. And it's that low elevation snowpack we're worried about, that 4,000 to 6,000 foot band, um, which is already pretty warm snow as is. If you drive over Santiam Pass in the winter and you look at the trip camera, it normally says 32, 33, and it's snowing. So think about a few degrees of warming and you've got rain. Um, and there will always be snow on the top of Mount Hood. You know, people will give out these theories that Oregon's going to be completely snow free in the next century and that's not true. But that lower elevation actually covers a lot of surface area because of the volcanoes and contributes quite a bit to our water supply. We also have places in the state that don't have reservoirs. Uh, the John Day Basin is a great example of this where they rely entirely on the snowpack and spring and summer precip for stream flow. Mm and their mountains aren't as tall as the Cascades. Do they have uh, wells there, or the wells are fed from the rivers? They do have wells, and one of the things that happens with a drought declaration from the governor is that you can drill a temporary well um, and access groundwater in some of these counties, which people have done already. So 14 of Oregon's 36 counties have been given some sort of declaration by the governor I mean, some sort, um, have either been forwarded to the governor or she signed a declaration for them, uh, which is the most that it's been in, I don't want to, I don't know how many years, um, but more than last year. And there are more on the way. You mentioned earlier that water storage is controversial. Were you talking about here in Oregon? Oh, yeah. So why is that? Because we built a lot of dams early in the century in the middle of the 20th century. And then we started taking them out because we realized they were either detrimental to fish or causing all sorts of adverse ecological impacts. So now, and we built those dams in part to store water, um, also for hydropower production. So now what are we going to do? We, we built these dams, we want them out. Are we gonna start building more dams and reservoirs? Some people would love that, but I, I don't see it moving in that direction. So it's, it's certainly a hot topic. Well, what about smaller efforts at um, uh, containing water, like backyard cisterns, that sort of thing? Are those controversial as well? No, um, not as much. Some states have actually outlawed rainwater collection because water is meant to be held in the public trust, and they see it as you taking something that's not necessarily yours to take. Uh, but I don't think that's happened in Oregon, and I don't know that it it's enough of a contribution right now that it's an, that people are collecting enough rainwater that it's not going into the streams. Um, personal, personal things will add up, like I said, putting the bucket in your shower, but really our biggest issue in the West is the way we deal out water, our water policy, the water rights structure. 
but it's an institution and it's not something you can take away easily. It's set in law. So Oregon can't say, okay, we're done with water rights. Um, we're going to move to a new system. <laughs> or at least not without a revolution. No. <laughs> Armed mobs, you know, with torches and that sort of thing. Do you know much about the water rights system and how, who, how, do we have senior water rights like they do in California and junior water light rights and all that? Yeah, so California is a little bit of a different animal because they have riparian rights as well, which is how the East Coast operates if you live near the stream, the water shores. But here, yes, in Oregon, we have uh, first in time, first in right. Uh, if you got what does here, that mean? If you got here first, uh, your water right is more senior to other people. And so the water that, right's tied to the land. Does that mean then that an Indian reservation would have senior water rights because they were there first? So that actually is a, um, that was a court case and most of the reservations have rights more senior to other um, water users. It, it's not as simple as, well, Kathy got here first, so here's her water, and then Lee got here first, and then here's her water. Um, In-stream flow rights, so the state has rights to keep flows in stream for fish as well, sometimes bump up mm -hmm. higher than others. But we do have junior users, and we're seeing junior users get cut off already this year. So people saying there isn't going to be enough flow in the stream, you're not getting your water. Are, th are there any public assistance programs for people like that who maybe stand to be ruined if they lose their orchard, for example? So there are two mechanisms. One is at the state level. So with a drought declaration, there are some administrative remedies. But at the federal level, that's where the money is dispersed for disaster relief. And the USDA is in charge of this, the US Department of Agriculture. And they base it off this drought monitor map that tracks drought across the country. Um, and it, Oregon's in one of the most severe categories right now, so south and east Oregon. But when you're in D2, which is severe drought or above, for eight weeks in a row, or in a contiguous county, they release funding um, for you. And that happened in, because of the 2012 drought in the Plains states. Um, they needed a faster way to get relief to people. So I, many of the counties in Oregon have received a federal declaration and I think funds are being made available. But drought is one of those things that we see it coming. It's a slow motion disaster. We should never be surprised by drought, but we have all these uh, mechanisms in place where then we have to send money out the door very fast. So it, it seems like um, I was explaining to a colleague the other day that the impacts of drought are local, the actions at the state level and the money's at the federal level, and sometimes it's difficult to get all three together. Well, then there's also the very important psychological factor, which is that's not really a drought. Um, we're just having a dry spell. Oh, you know, yeah. And this will pass. You know, we live in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you know, our, our team name is the Ducks. There's a reason for that. And, you know, th this will all go away and be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think maybe that is our biggest enemy. It's that kind of thinking that it's not there. I don't see a problem. It's not there. Yeah. Well, I'm a beaver, so actually the Ducks are my biggest enemy. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring up school rivalries. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's bound to come up when you come to Eugene. Um, but yeah, it, we will come out of this drought at some point. This isn't going to be forever. Uh, but when you talk to people who've been impacted for the past four years, they're starting to say, maybe this isn't a dry spell. Maybe this is actually a drought. Maybe this is going to keep happening. Um, and there is, like you said, the psychological factor. Even here in Western Oregon, it started raining again, and people just, oh, it's raining again, I can't deal with it. Well, you've had a pretty dry year. Um, you can take a few days of rain. Yeah, it, I've been just abjectly grateful every time we get a few sprinkles. <laughs> of course, I'm a gardener. Yeah. So I, I, it's really important to me, and I, I can understand that somebody who is living for their hiking trip on the weekend and then it gets rained out, maybe wouldn't be too happy about that. But, you know, we've got, a, we've got much bigger fish to fry. Yeah, and yeah. you know what you got into moving to Oregon, exactly. I tell people. I, exactly. It actually feels right when it rains. It um. does, it feels right. It, you know, it, it supports the, 
the flora and the fauna that are such an important part of living here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, what other depressing things can you tell us <laughs> no, on I'm this subject? Not very much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a problem getting uh, in party invitations? Or <laughs> <laughs> People are saying, oh God, don't invite Kathy. Don't invite the climate change person. <laughs> yeah, and it's completely opposite to my personality too because I actually like to have a lot of fun. But um, <laughs> to me, this issue is so important that I feel like I have to work on it. I went to school to be a meteorologist. I'm fascinated by the weather. Mm -hmm. But there was a point where I realized I didn't care about forecasting the weather all that much wasn't actually that good at it either. And I wanted to work on something bigger um, related to the atmosphere. So I took the climate change direction. Um, in terms of maybe, maybe there's a, there's a lot of articles going around saying that everybody's going to move to Oregon because of climate change. I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, the New York Times had one saying, well, Oregon's not going to really be affected by climate change, so you should move there or Anchorage. Um, <laughs> the Oregon is not going to be affected by climate change? Uh, pretty much, or less affected than the rest of the country, and it depends on and how the, you... We're talking about in the short or medium term? Uh, or mm -hmm. they just think we're not going to be affected? They just think that our impacts are less than others because we, we don't have as many natural disasters as the rest of the country already, and we know that. Our weather's pretty boring. If you study weather here, it's... <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you have the hope of that one thunderstorm that passes through and then fizzles out. Mm -hmm. um, or the snow that happened in Corvallis. I was delighted for about three weeks over that, and that was a normal thing for me in my past life. But um, and people just think that we were less vulnerable to climate change, but I went through the coasts, the agriculture, the water, the forest, and that covers our entire state. Um, our fire risk is going to go up. We're worried about our water supply going forward. Um, I don't think that people will move here to stay safe from climate change. Although people do call now and ask if we have enough water for them to move here. Hmm, really? Yeah. They call your office specifically or? I don't know how people get to me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I it was those people who <laughs> avoided uh, inviting you to their party. They said, you need to talk to Kathy about that information. <gasps> yeah, they call and ask me all sorts of real estate questions. <laughs> <laughs> Climatologists and real estate agents. Yeah, I mean, I didn't realize you needed to have so many talents when you got into this public sector climatology. <laughs> I mean, it will diverge sometimes into, okay, well, I like this climate, where should I move to? And that's a fine question. And then they ask about the school districts and the grocery stores. I, I Google that. <laughs> <laughs> Spent a lot of time in school. <laughs> oh, that's great. I guess it's great. It, uh, maybe people are, are doing the best they can to, to be realistic about all of this. Yeah, and those phone calls actually do make good stories at those parties that I do get invited to. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm still thinking about the perception that we're going to be less affected. Um, because the, the reporting that I have read is that it, it's coming here too, it just may not get here as as severely as as it will in California in the next few years, but but, but yeah, it's coming here. It's too. here. Yeah. Um, we can point to things like our snowpack. I call that the smoking gun of Northwest climate change. It's declined over time. Temperatures have gone up. Um, you can put those two pieces together and figure out climate. We've warmed here. We're going to continue to warm. Um, mm. When the National Climate Assessment came out last year, the messaging with it was a little bit different than it has been in the past. It was climate change is here and now impacting the U.S. Um, and it's very, it's very real. So it stopped talking about it as something in the future. It's now. Are there any efforts between states? Like, is, is Oregon talking to California and California talking to Washington and Washington talking to Idaho about ways to 
work together? Are, are there ways that they can work together? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we do in our institute is we host a federal research consortium for the Northwest. So we work with Washington and Idaho a lot. Um, a lot of Columbia Basin issues where we're all in one basin. We have different state lines. Um, I work a lot with my colleagues around the country, including mostly in the western U.S., about climate issues. Um, we know that climate doesn't conform to state lines, but a lot, of, a lot of lessons learned from California are coming up to Oregon. As Oregon starts to think about grappling with these things, people from California have come up and talked to them. Um, I, you're definitely seeing some states work together, especially the West Coast states. You know, I have family in the Midwest. That's where I'm from. And they've had so much rain and snow the, the last couple of years. Is that, is that a, do, I know that's not your area, but <laughs> do you know if that is expected to continue that kind of, I mean, it's kind of like a, a, a reverse thing that, from what we're dealing with. Oh, yeah. Will our drought, I, I assume our drought tendency will continue. Will their rain and snow tendency continue as well? I don't know. Um, so the past winter in particular was very interesting. Uh, the Northeast had record cold. Boston had more snow than we got in our mountains, which is just bizarre. Um, and it was, if you looked at the atmospheric pattern, we had a very strong ridge over the western U.S. and then just this trough with all this Arctic air pouring into the eastern U.S. And a lot of people have jumped on this, why did this happen? Um, and there are a few theories. Um, none that I'm going to go into right now, but I don't know what the next winter looks like for them. Like I said, the six-month time period, we'd love to be able to forecast that well, and we have some ideas, but I, I, don't, I don't know if they'll be cold again. Um, I know a lot of people wish that they will not be. Um, it was one of the coldest starts of the year, I think, in New York, where I'm from, while well, Oregon, where I moved to, had its warmest start to the year. Eons ago, I took a meteor meteorology course in college, and one of the things that I remember from that class was how incredibly difficult it is to predict the weather. I mean, I, I imagine they have better technology now than they did when I was in, cool, in college, but still, um, it must, be, it must be a really inexact science. So they're getting better, and it's even since I've been in college that they've gotten better. Um, Hurricane Sandy, if you looked at the forecasts for that, they were spot on almost 10 days out that there was going to be some sort of big wind event <coughs> that went up the East Coast, and then obviously it turned into a hurricane. But that sort of forecast is just mind-blowing um, that they could do that. And there's a little bit of skepticism when you see that, well, it's 10 days out. Are we really going to trust this model? But we've gotten, we've gotten a lot better at this sort of thing. And I like to remind people that you remember when the forecast is blown. You remember when it's completely wrong. But rarely do you look at the forecast and say, wow, that was exactly right. It is 72 and sunny today. Um, so it's, it's incredibly difficult. And like I said, I wasn't very good at it. Um, and you have to know a lot about your local geography and all the nuances, all the microclimates. Um, you'll have little nicknames for things. We used to have the donut in Albany, New York, where the storms just seemed to go around the city. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's certainly difficult, and I really respect my colleagues who take on that career. One of the things that I noticed when I moved here was how often the weather report or weather predictions were incorrect. And I just always assumed it was because of the topography. You know, you've got the coast range, and then a valley, and then another mountain range, and that that must create uh, a lot of really strange wind currents and temperature gradients that, that make the weather very, very weird. Yeah, we see it a lot in the winter when we get inversions. So when it seems like, OK, maybe it will mix a little bit today, and we can get out of this fog that we're in. Um, or then we just end up in it for two weeks. But mm -hmm. I, I, I think, again, we're just getting so much better at this. The science is so much better than it used to be. Well, I guess that's, that's good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's good because we can kind of predict what's coming, but it's bad because what we're predicting coming is, is so nightmarish. 
it is nightmarish, but I like, like I said, we still have a chance to change things. The train hasn't left the station. Um, what do you mean by a chance to change things? Can you define that? We still have a chance to change the amount of warming that the globe and the Northwest will see. We still have a chance to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We still have a chance to develop more renewable technologies, uh, live cleaner um, and more efficiently and more sustainably. So. Uh, there's a good analogy that if you're on the highway and you miss your exit, you just don't keep going forever. You try to get off on the next exit. So we've missed a few exits, but there are still a few exits down the road that we can get off. Um, it's, it's not hopeless yet. We still have some time. So what you're saying is that what we could do is try to slow down what is happening. We can't, we can't stop it but we could try to make it a little bit better for our children and grandchildren. Yeah, um, we could live in a world with a little bit of warming. We have, um, but some of the higher projections are terrifying, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a different planet that we're living on. Um, but like I said, there's still time, and I think we're starting to see some of these talks become maybe a little bit more serious. Um, the U.S. and China are talking to each other. Mexico has pledged to reduce its emissions. So as long as the big countries jump on board, I, and I recognize it has to be China in, and India as well as the US, mm -hmm. um, we can see a change. I'm optimistic. I have to be. <laughs> I have to live for so much longer and work <laughs> for so much longer. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, middle-aged, and so I, I keep thinking, well, maybe I'll be dead before it gets truly horrible. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of hope so, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> <laughs> and on that cheery note, <laughs> do you have any any final uh, observations that that you would like to to talk about? No, um, I mean we live in, like I said, I think Oregon is well positioned to address some of these vulnerabilities that we have. We did a lot of smart things early on, our land use planning being one of them, and also making our beaches public. Um, so we have some room there to adapt to climate change. And again, I'm optimistic that we can change things. I'm optimistic that we won't be on the upper, the upper end of the temperature projections, that we can go somewhere lower and leave a better planet, or at least a livable planet, for the next few generations. Well, that, that certainly sounds optimistic, and I, I hope that, that enough people will join you in thinking that way that we can actually make it happen. I hope so, too. <laughs> Thank you very much for being on the show, Kathy. This has been most enlightening. Uh, Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> this has been Gardening and Beyond, a show for folks who appreciate what Mr. Rain does for their green friends. Join us next week as we further explore growing things. Thank you.